Welcome to Study Abroad Like Ajeed, the podcast. My name is Justine, and I am the host and founder of Study Abroad Like G, where G means global citizen. I believe that it is extremely important to be a conscious traveler everywhere you go. And here, I'm going to share with you some of my stories, and trust me, I've got a lot of them. I also want to introduce you to some of my friends, who I also call my global homies, and we're going to serve as the plug to all your study abroad needs. We're going to give you some knowledge on things we wish we knew when we were applying, studying abroad, and even when we returned. I also want to help you navigate through the study abroad networks. And here, I also want to teach you how to use your experience to your benefit in life. Alrighty, let's get ready for our adventure. Now it's time to buckle up because we're about to visit another gorgeous country. I'm going to give you a few hints. One, they declared independence from the British Empire in 1957. Two, shoe designer Jimmy True was born here. Three, they have 40,934 miles of highway. Can you guess where we're going? You're right. We're going to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. All right, now that we have landed in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, uh, we're going to dive into our adventure today. And today we're going to talk about on this episode is rediscovering yourself. Um, It's one of those things you don't think about. It's definitely something that Um, can happen over time or happen at one moment, but it's definitely something that happens when you travel a lot. Uh, It's one of the things that I'm so grateful for. I've learned so much about myself. There are things that I've rediscovered about myself that I've forgotten. Um, And I've learned to, you know, pick those things back up. Those are things that I need in life. There are some things I discovered about myself that I should probably leave behind. And so uh, I wanted to Uh, bring a friend or a global homie on this episode that is going to talk about their experience in studying abroad or traveling abroad and how that has shaped who they are, um, how it has shaped what they want to do, and how it has shaped what they're currently doing. Uh, So without further ado, we're going to go on and dive into the bio of our global homie for this episode. A wanderer at heart, Wad Kalafala has explored over 40 countries. Ask her how. Her first passion is love in all forms. She values freedom, community, and creativity. This Sudanese woman earned her master's in political administration from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and loves to write. Let her help you Get your dream job through resume and cover letter help. I want you all to meet the amazing, the gorgeous, the pure hearted Wad Kalafala. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, Justine. I'm so excited to be here. Um, My name is Wad Kalafala, sometimes also known as Wanderlust Wad. I am a lover, traveler, poet. um, And in terms of a nine to five, I am a communications director at a nonprofit in DC. Um, And just so excited to be here. I've been to over 40 plus countries at this point. Love, love, love traveling and love making it accessible. So thank you so much for doing this podcast because we need it. Thank you. No, y'all, I'm so honored by Wad. One, so me and Wad met in the (laughs) <laughs> I think the most wildest way, and I don't know if you remember, but we met in the theater at our beloved Meadowbrook High School, um, and we were dancing. <laughs> and we were dancing, and then afterwards, we introduced ourselves. <laughs> and I think, like, that's just, uh, that stuck with me so much, but Wad has been um, just such a blessing in my life in high school, 
Um, and it's just been uh, just so amazing watching you grow, watching you travel. Um, like you all heard, she's been to 40 plus countries. So we're going to get into, uh, into this. And so the first question is, uh, what encouraged you uh, to study abroad or to go abroad um, when it comes to traveling? Yeah, I would say um, the first time I came abroad actually was to the United States, right? Because I was <laughs> I was born in Sudan, um, which is in Africa, right under Egypt for all of those who don't know. And so I think from there, that that stark shift from like what I knew back home to coming to America and like living this life really just made me interested. Like there's so much outside of just these two dichotomies. There's mm -hmm. so many other countries. And if it was this much of a difference, like what else is there that's available? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I was initially interested in just traveling and really made it my goal to visit. Um, I wanted to visit all seven continents. I still do. I've hit six at this point. So I'm like, what? So close. Antarctica, I'm coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming for you. Um, but that's really what like ignited my like my passion and my desire for traveling. For a long time, I thought I wanted to be a flight attendant, actually, because I remember like my first flight back to Sudan being on um, Ethiopian Airlines. My mom was sleeping and they're like walking, running down the, the little walkway trying to pass out food. And I was like, I, I, um, excuse me, like, can I help you guys? And they were like, sure. And they let me help. And my mom woke up like, where the hell is my child? You know, and I'm like all the way down the aisle, like beef or chicken. <laughs> my mom was like ready to snatch me up. And they're like, no, no, she's such a help. And I'm like, yeah, mom, I'm doing the travel thing right now. Okay. Um, but honestly, like the whole experience of traveling has always been felt so glamorizing and, and so inaccessible to so many people. And I knew that it couldn't always be that way. So I really just wanted to see the world because generally I'm a rebel. And when people are like, you can't do this, I'm like, yes, I can. <laughs> yes, I can. Um, so anyways, a long about way of why I'm interested in travel. Um, how I got into studying abroad, like through Fulbright, was honestly something very similar to what you're you're doing and making accessible for so many people. And that's why I think it's really important because I just had someone, I was at UNC Chapel Hill at the time um, and I was on my last year and I was talking to a person of color who worked there and I was like, I don't know what to do when I graduate. Like it's coming up in this year. I'm not sure where to go, what to do. Mm -hmm. All I wanna do is see the world and live my life like I, that's all I want to do and she was like listen why don't you look at getting a Fulbright like it really seems up your alley yeah you can have a nice year to do x y and z you can teach you can blah 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 experience a different world and whenever I heard a Fulbright I was like that's that's so beyond anything that I could ever I was like girl it's a Fulbright like why would you even try to play me like that <laughs> why would you even try to play like don't do that and she was like listen to me i've seen your work you need to apply and honest to goodness i literally applied just off of off the strength of her belief in me oh. like off of her the strength of her belief in me i was like whatever okay and i, I gave my best to the application right i was like i'm gonna do my best but like i'm not betting on anything mm. lo and behold Months later, a bitch gets a call. She got the <laughs> And I couldn't believe it. And it made me think about all the opportunities that I would have allowed to slip through my fingers just mm -hmm. because I didn't believe in myself to go after them. So I'm so, so, so thankful to Iman. Thank you so much, Iman. I love you so much. Aww. And you saved my life. Yeah, absolutely. Shout so do it. Thank you so much. <laughs> no. I I I think that is so true because I think about like applications that I've I've filled out for studying abroad and I'm like like my mom told like my mom was it was my mom my mom was like oh go on and do this and I was like girl you need to stop playing and I'd be like I mean mom I, I you need to stop playing like why well, don't you do that and then I would do it I'm like 
Y'all want me? Right. Y'all think I'm smart enough? And I think like, and I think sometimes um, as member members of the um, Black Indigenous people of color community, we don't think that we're smart enough for things when a lot of the times we exceed the expectations and the qualifications. And I have learned that and I've, and you as well, like we've been in enough circles, you know, um, domestically and internationally. And it's just kind of like, hey, I should have been here, you know, a few years ago. Like I deserve to be in these spaces. And I think that is so important. And a lot of us, we don't have, um, a parent or an iman in our life that like will push us and say like go for the crazy things like yeah like you're in the valley but why not shoot for the moon and like a lot of times it's like shoot for the moon because a lot of times you'll get it and i i loved that and i and when you got the fulbright i was like well duh of course well, i got the fulbright like Girl, why it's, in my mind. <laughs> It's so fun, but that's why I'll always say this, Justine, is like the spaces that you're creating here are so important because for people who don't have someone like an Iman or someone like your parents or, or whomever, like they will have this mm -hmm. or, or like other resources that they can turn to where they can see people like them, like who are succeeding, who are doing it, who are traveling, who are studying abroad and doing so successfully. You know what I mean? Giving you the real about what it's like to be a black person or a person of color, indigenous or person of color overseas and like how that affects them. You don't get that same experience when you're talking to white people. You know what I mean? Like they live lives that are different than ours. Totally different and free. Um, there, of course, like, th like there's benefits in having a blue passport, having a U.S. passport. There is an amazing benefit and privilege to that. Um, but how you look, um, sometimes your passport um, doesn't dictate how you look. And I've had an array of, <laughs> um, of good and bad um, experiences, but not letting the bad parts stop me and not letting the good, good parts um, think like that's as good as it gets. Um, and so that's why I was like, again, that's why I was like, well, I need to have one. Because I remember you, you had a, um, you had a, a time, I think you went to Trinidad for Carnival? Girl! <laughs> yes, I did. And I was yes, so I, did. I was like, oh, I need to call up one of my cousins. I was like, I, I want to go to Trinidad for Carnival. But I saw it and I just, I think I just loved seeing you like be there and experience it and have fun. Um and have fun in um, a culture uh, that I think sometimes people of the Black, um, not all people of the Black um, diaspora take part in. I think sometimes we're like, oh, like, uh, not right now. Uh, I won't do that. And then it's, but then like, if you realize like what it is, it's just like, oh, like, yeah, let me step on in there. <laughs> that, I mean, car I mean, I'll speak on Carnival just generally, but that experience completely changed the way that I saw myself, my body, like literally seeing 80, 90 year old women half naked in the streets because like, that's what they're wearing, completely comfortable in their body, shaking that ass. I was like, girl, you're doing that? Me too. Me too. No, and, and I think like those are the type of things you're just like, I wish I had experienced this like at a younger age because I think we get so conscious of our bodies and we, I, you know, we think about times like when we were in high school, it's like, oh, I'm so fat. And I'm now I'm like, oh, I wish I was the same fat. Like, <laughs> you, you go through these things, but it's yeah. like just being appreciative that your body is moving, that you have it mm -hmm. and seeing the beauty in it. Um, outside of what society and of course a, a large colonial you know patriarchal society says which doesn't really matter because at the end of the day like that society um doesn't physically lay down with you um at night when you go to sleep and so when i saw you participate i was like oh my gosh this is so beautiful but Thank you. <laughs> but i want to get um into uh another uh an, another uh, question. So when it comes to uh, studying abroad or traveling abroad, um, how has that experience 
um, being a globe trotter, how how has that experience um, shaped uh, your life, shaped your everyday life, whether it comes to work or just how you um, navigate through spaces? Oh man, it's I think the lens that I now come to um, all of my my work positions, all of my relationships with is one of inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not something I was necessarily like aware of, I think before I started traveling. Mm -hmm. But when you're, because I love solo traveling too, right? Like that's my thing. <laughs> and when you're solo traveling, like there's, it's fun and there's solace and like knowing that you're like good and you're by yourself. But I'm the kind of traveler who also wants to be immersed in the culture. And that means that yeah. someone has to open a doorway for you mm -hmm. to join into that culture, whether that's like an invitation for dinner at a family home or whatever, like someone has to be that bridge for you mm -hmm. um, and you can't move past that. So I think the way that that's shifted how I navigate like in all of my relationships and in my work is that I do my best to be that bridge for people. Mm -hmm. You know, when like there's a new person if there's a if there's another person of color at the table or like if there's someone I feel like I'm a great facilitator in terms of like if I notice someone is more quiet like mm -hmm. I try to create a space where they're comfortable speaking in that space and mm -hmm. those aren't things that I think those are talents I specifically picked up because I've been in spaces that didn't allow for that for me mm -hmm. and so then I became hyper conscious of when when are those doors open how are they open for me and how can i start creating those doors for other people too yeah um so that that's what i would think is like the main way traveling has like shifted my perspective um other ways is just like be becoming like a more accepting person like there's there's no right or wrong way to do anything it's literally just what you do versus what they do yeah. um because i and, and it's so relevant in language too because um even when i like in malaysia for example i had to learn to drive on the left side of the road like we were given a car mm -hmm. i had to drive on the left and i remember thinking to myself like why do they drive on the wrong side of the road and i remember like having a conversation with the teacher like yeah like you guys like drive on the wrong side and she was like no, you drive on the wrong side. And I was like, oh, there's no, like a lot of times we give such value-based judgments to things that don't have that. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it's not good or bad to drive left or right. It's just how things are done. And so learning to assimilate to those things. And I think because I came here at such a young age, it was a lot easier for me to assimilate to other cultures. Mm -hmm. Versus someone who's lived here their whole life, I think it would be maybe a little bit more difficult, especially if you're part of the majority of this country, mm -hmm. because you've never had to do something like code switch. You've mm -hmm. never had to do something like, you know, like just change up certain things, you know, like your hair or like adjust or tweak. So when you go to another country as not a person of color, Mm -hmm. um, and now you're the minority and you're expected to sort of like adjust accordingly, it becomes more difficult for you. And I found that to be prevalent in almost all of my white counterparts, like people in my cohort who had a really difficult time adjusting because they were never required to here. That mm -hmm. was always something left up to black people, indigenous people and other people of color. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a really interesting experience for me to think like, wow, I guess you've never been in a space where that's required of you, where we live in a space that requires that of us every single day. Every single I wake up, I have to. <laughs> like, no, no, and that's so true from everywhere, everywhere I've traveled abroad. I think my, my um, favorite places have been places where I've been able to blend in. And I know I can become part of the people seamlessly. And realizing that like that privilege that I don't get it like I get it at home but I mean I can't really I blend in with my family my family in the school and I was like oh that's Justine but I'm saying like I could blend in you know in a group of people in you know in Salvador Brazil or in Ghana and South Africa and like people were just like like come up me and talk to me in their language because they thought and like that was just <gasps> I was like don't play with my heart right now. I don't know if I can say 
but no, I, I think that's so those moments because we don't feel we don't get those moments outside of our community, our our village, and um, when we get those moments with people we don't know, it's like mind blowing, and it's like having and I call it black privilege <laughs> because it's just like oh, like is this what it feels like? It is. And, um, it's, you know, having somebody go the extra mile for you because you look like them and they have, they don't even know like who your mother is. They like, yeah, I don't know who your parents are, but, and it's just like, oh. but I mean, what you said, I, I've seen, I've seen white counterparts when studying abroad, um, they go to they, you know, they have trouble with certain things. And I'm just like, I don't understand why they're not doing this. And I'm just like, girl. <laughs> you know, I've had that. I've had that, you know, happen <laughs> to me in the U.S. But it, I, it was just very interesting. And I'm so glad you said that because it, there is a beauty in not having to code switch and just being able to be like authentically you and share who you are like outright and not having to be um apologetic for it mm-hmm. and just like keep going and not having to have a second thought about what you L- did or said literally yes yeah and especially like issues surrounding police like I felt secure and safe in in like when I would see police officers and mm-hmm. that was a new experience for me because we don't have that here like we don't know her safety what's that security in the presence of law enforcement i don't know her um but you know honestly like one of there's a lot of difficult things that are presented to you when you live abroad one of the things that was one of the most difficult things for me personally was watching white people complain about the country that we were in um That was, I can deal with taking a cold shower on a pretty regular basis. I can deal with that. I can deal with like air conditioning being off for a day or so. I can like, I I can deal. But something that always just like raised my blood pressure where I was like, (laughs) was hearing, hearing the complaints of white people who no longer have the privilege that comes associated with American mm-hmm. colonialism. Like, well, why do we have to, well, why blah, blah, blah. And it's like, girl, those thoughts, they run through my mind on the daily in the United States, on the daily, all right? We're not there anymore. I really need you to just get in line, you know? I really just need you to start that assimilation processes because you, I've, I've seen things that I was just like, uh, and I, so my philosophy is always when I go to another country, I need to act if, a, if okay, like I would at home mm-hmm. um, until otherwise. Uh, that means, uh, you know, certain time at night, I don't need to be out by myself. Mm-hmm. Um that means, you know, if I'm walking, I'm not walking with money in my hand, counting mm-hmm. it, that I just pulled out of the ATM. Right. Um, <laughs> and I've seen that. Um, and I, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not doing anything that will help me go missing. Um, and people laugh about when I say that, but I was like, you know, in these other countries, and I'm not saying that other countries are more violent but they have laws and regulations you have to follow just like in the u.s and so when we hear these stories of americans who um are not part of the bipoc community and they do things in other countries um that are not um european based and they do these illegal things and they're like i shouldn't be it's just kind of like that is a that's a plain everyday law that everybody knew ex- like there's no way you didn't know that and you can't ex- you can't always rely on you being american um saving you because in certain countries it won't save you i i i guess i kind of went abroad knowing that in my mind 
Um, and not as a scare tactic, but as a, I guess, survival in a sense, mm-hmm. like my number one thing is like, I need to come home alive. One piece. Yeah. Um, so that means I'm not going to do, I'm not going to go to Morocco and steal things because <laughs> <laughs> you're laughing because you know, like they don't play those games. No, they don't. And, like certain countries, they're just not playing it. And yeah. you have to learn how to assimilate. And if you don't want to assimilate, then don't go. Like even going to, you know, European countries, there are certain things you can't do because, you know, it's common in America. You can't do that there. And so um, you saying that is just, I understand. I felt that. I've seen it. I've just, I've walked away because I'm just like, I I can't that's, see how this ends. <laughs> that's part of the experience though, right? Is like, yeah. I think one of the best, parts of the experience of studying abroad is learning to live like the people who are living there mm. is assimilating to the culture it is like undoubtedly it is one of the more difficult parts you know what I mean like mm. it's not easy but that's like the any point of pain is a point of growth and you you won't allow yourself to grow if you refuse to learn something new to learn a new culture to learn a new language like that's that's the the beauty of people who decide that they want to study abroad is that they've chosen individually chosen to thrust themselves into an uncomfortable space because they'll know they'll come out better on the other end of it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Like, it's just, that's, that's one of the most beautiful things I think about studying abroad and you rob yourself of that experience when you plant your feet in the ground and just dig into what you know, like, it's a time for flexibility. Like it's a time for softness. It's a time for learning and for growth and like lean into that, you know, get out of like the stubbornness of like, this is what I know. I'm always right. No, sweetheart. You're in a new country. You don't know shit. You don't know, <laughs> you don't know anything. And so just lean into that. It's okay. It's, and study abroad programs for the most part. Um, do a great job of equipping you with resources and people to turn to Mm -hmm. when you're, when you're going through those problems, when you're going through those issues and and you feel like you really need a guiding source. So I just think it's really important. I think it's important for everyone to do. And I really applaud all of the people who decide to thrust themselves into those experiences because it's not easy, but it's so rewarding. It's so so rewarding. So rewarding. So with that, um, we're going to circle back to home. So when you decided to travel and, uh, and to do Fulbright, you know, any of those um, experiences, how did your family react with you saying, all right, I'm out of here. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm going on over there. Because I know everybody, we all have uh, stories of uh, parents either being supportive, um, being emotionally supportive but can't financially support us you know there's all different types of support so how was it for you um and your parents and you're saying like oh i'm you know i'm I'm outy uh (laughs) yeah so you know as a woman as a muslim woman as a sudanese muslim woman My parents would only financially support one trip, and that was to Sudan. <laughs> that was- oh, man. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Want to go to Sudan? We'll buy that ticket. Go back, you know? Anywhere else. Like, it was inconceivable for both of my parents to think that I would want to, tra- like, that I would want to travel. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of my first, I think my first trip actually was with Maddie. Um, I think, and that was to, um, that was to Indonesia and Thailand. We went to Bali. Yeah. Yeah, We went to Bali, went to Thailand. Um, and I remember like, I have been working, doing my thing. I'm like saving guap because my, I know like they're not about to financially support this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is going to be a hard sell, you know, like I'm, Hey, parents, taking three weeks off, going to go to the other side of the world. Be back soon, though. Right. (laughs) Um, And I remember my mom asking me, like, why are you doing this? Like, travel with your husband. You don't. Why are you traveling right now with friends? Like, I don't understand. I'm like, girl, what husband? 
husband. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do we see rings? Like, <laughs> I'm confused. Um, but it was just like, in, in my mom's mind, those are experiences that are like for your marriage or like when you go to that household, because that's how she's always grown up. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until actually like literally a month ago, Justine, where I had a conversation with my mom where she was like, you know, I really want to do a trip with my friends and I'd like to travel and see the world. And I just sat there and looked at her and I'm like, so 15 years later, here you are. <laughs> and she was like, she was like, well, like the way parenting works is that I teach you. And then I also learn from you in return. You know, and she was like, I gave you, cause she gave, they both gave me a really hard time. Mm -hmm. You know, like you're a Muslim woman, you're going to be traveling alone. You're doing this with a friend, you're blah, blah, blah. Like we don't approve, um, but I'm a, I'm a hard headed bitch, you know? <laughs> so, so I was like, I respect you guys. And, and especially coming from like a, a Arab household, mm -hmm. I just had to really just be like, like set a boundary. I love both of you very much. Mm -hmm. I respect your opinion immensely, unfortunately, there's been an override, right? <laughs> and then I, I love you guys so much. I respect you. This is something I feel like I have to do for myself. And I, I set a plan out for them. Like, I will give you all of my information of like places I'm staying, of like where, um, like what our itinerary is, like going and coming back. You'll obviously, you'll drop me at the airport. I'll be reaching out to you through WhatsApp once every however many days. Like, because really at the end of the day, they just want to know that you're being safe. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that was like a good, a good entryway for my parents. They weren't initially very emotionally supportive. Mm -hmm. They weren't financially supportive at all. Um, but they, for lack of better words, like they let me, you know, and that's so much more than a lot of other women in my position would be able to say. Um, and I think that a part of it was my boldness and like my refusal to hear no. Mm -hmm. um, but another part of it too was also like my parents seeing and understanding that like this is something that really meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. um, and they wanted me to have that experience to some, to some degree, to some level. And now my mom mm -hmm. says like, if I knew I would have said travel earlier, travel earlier. And I'm like, now? <laughs> like, thanks. <laughs> But it's better late than never. And I think something that I would encourage all people in my position to do is like to, you can't drop things at parents. You got to walk them through the steps, mm. you know, like drop a nugget here. Like, what do you guys think about this place? Drop a nugget there. Like, you know, and then you slowly walk them into mm -hmm. this idea because for so many parents and people, it's so unattainable. Like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? What about school? What about work? What about this? Like, how are you going to do this? And if you, if you don't have the answers to that, that is going to overwhelm you. And then you will start to believe I can't do this. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Other, other people's um, uh, insecurities about a situation can turn you away from wanting to do something that can legitimately like change your life. Absolutely. And that, so similar thing um I went to when I went to Lebanon and that was the first time I left the U.S. by myself mm -hmm. um really, I remember I left the continent and mm -hmm. I was like so excited and I had told my mom I'm going and my mom was like mm, we'll think about it and I was like mom well why can't I and it wasn't that she had a fear of people there like people stereotypically was like oh you're gonna get bombed there that wasn't my mom's um my mom wasn't scared about the people but there was a situation where um, one of her brothers, when um, she was younger, uh, he was in the military and stationed in Lebanon in the 80s, and there was a bombing there. So her idea was like, I almost lost my brother. I can't lose my baby girl. Yeah. And I was just like, I'm going to be fine. Like, you know, my, I was just like, <laughs> that was then, this is now. You know, I got a smartphone. Things are, <laughs> you know, and granted, like, uh, different, but... I always knew like, oh, I'll be safe wherever I go. Like, I never thought that I would not be safe. If anything, I was, I, when I showed up, they were just like, oh, are you African? What country are you from? <laughs> well, uh, once upon a time. Uh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> 400 
hundred years ago, you know, <laughs> um, it was a, it was very interesting because like, like you said, your parents just want you to be safe. And a lot of times don't always, people don't go, always go against your parents. Sometimes you have to, but yeah. when you grow up, you're, there's a time where you're going to have to make decisions for yourself. Mm -hmm. And your parents may not be for those decisions, but those decisions ultimately will affect how you live your life day to day or how you just live it in general um, versus letting your parents make the decisions for you um, because you want to start doing it yourself because then your parents one day, one day are going to be like, why are you asking me? You're grown. And then it's just like, oh, now, now I'm going to yeah. <laughs> You know, it like what you, everything that you're saying just resonates so deeply and makes me think of like something I think about often, which is other people's interpretation of my life, my dreams, my goals is not a reflection of me. It is a reflection of them mm. and their experiences. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And just oh, I think, sorry, did you hear me? I went out. Yeah, I heard you. I heard you. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, I, um, I, oh, sorry. All right. Everything's fine. So, um, but no, yeah, I, that, that's so true because when people see things, it, you know, sometimes it triggers and then they go into like, you know, defense mode, whether that means um, I have to protect you or, you know, I have to do this, I have to do that. And um, I think we, as a younger generation, uh, younger than our parents, we have to learn how to, um, to, listen and know what the triggers are for our parents but also know how to navigate what we want to do and how to still do it um sometimes your parents will be upset it yeah. it happens um it's going to happen as you continue to get older and to make decisions for yourself <laughs> um but when you were talking about your parents um like i you don't need to do that. You could go on and wait. And, you know, I think, you know, we were in high school or younger, we think, oh, I can wait to uh, to travel the world because, you know, 25 years, being 25 years old was old when we were, you know, 17, 16. And then you become 25. Yeah. Like, Man, I'm young. Uh, I got so much. <laughs> and it's just like, you know, you, you don't, you, we created these, um, these, uh, these, this schedule, this life schedule, um, and my life schedule has yet to be on time. Girl. <laughs> um, I am uh, all the way on CP time with so many things on my life. <laughs> but I will say the things that I thought that would arrive later in life, um, such as traveling and going abroad, have arrived so early that it's just kind of like, oh, the other things, like, it'll, it'll come when it comes. And so yeah. you like you sharing, cause I have friends who have had different experiences and I was like, I know why the experience has to be uh, at least somewhat, <laughs> somewhat funny or interesting on how she just told her parents like, I'm gonna go. <laughs> I girl, cause they, it's also your parents' decision-making is based very loosely also like loosely on how their parents raised them, mm -hmm. but also loosely on how their friends parent their kids, mm. you know? And my parents just like have not known anyone, didn't know anyone who had a daughter who was my age and who decided that they were gonna go and their parents were like, cool, I go travel. You know, Like it's not in their sphere, it's not in their scope. They know nothing about it. So of course, when I bring it up, they're like, are you crazy? Like, do you, is, are you good? Do you, are you, <laughs> are you, do you? Um, <laughs> Exactly. And so, but that's for anyone. Like if you've never had the opportunity to experience something, if no one in your circle or in your circle circle has had that experience, you've never heard of a story of anyone doing that. When someone does it, you're like, I didn't even know that was possible. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, so I'm really, I am really grateful for my parents. Like I know they were concerned, but I'm grateful that at the end of the day, um, they like surrendered because that's what I yeah. believe I'm not a parent, but I believe like a, a big part of parenting is like guidance. Like I give you the tools, I give you the resources, I try to guide you. Um, parenting is not controlled because every individual is their own person. So sometimes you let people make mistakes and like, that's just what has to happen. So I'm glad that they 
they trusted me enough to allow me to either make that my mistake or my or my guidance you know and it no. worked out for the best like a girl's alive so <laughs> I mean, i'm in one piece <laughs> right there was a couple trying times i'm not gonna lie not in malaysia but other places where i was like i probably could have died huh <laughs> It's always that look back, you like, but then life is kind of like, but did you die? And you're like, girl, yeah, I did. Did, did you <laughs> die though? Like, you died I guess- <laughs> no, I, uh, I, no, I, I probably, I do have stories I probably haven't shared with my parents where it's close calls, like, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I'm here, like, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> That literally reminds me to be like, so what are those stories? Yeah. You think I'm going to tell my mom about this? Like years later, I'd be like, yeah, I was on this podcast. <laughs> she will have no, she won't even ever hear it. Um, it so, that reminds me, Justine, I'm so sorry. I know you got other questions, girl. No, you're but fine. that just reminds me of um, you saying like we almost died and stuff. It reminds me when I was in South Africa, um, I went to to or was i no i was in zambia Mm -hmm. and i went to the victoria falls bridge which connects zambia to zimbabwe Mm -hmm. and i saw people like bungee jumping and i was like oh i want to do that i want to do that and then i chickened out last minute i was like no like i'm too scared i can't do it you know and i went home and the next day like i went to the hotel we were staying at the next day is when we were supposed to leave Mm -hmm. and i literally woke up early that morning and I was like, okay, what time is the flight? And I, I literally, that whole night, I couldn't sleep. I was tossing and turning. I was like, I let myself down. This is a bucket list thing. I really let my fear get in the way. Like I woke up the next day. I woke up, my, you know, my, ab, my cousin, yes. for those who don't oh, know, my yeah. ab, oh. I woke my ab up. I was like, get up. We're going to Victoria Falls Bridge. <laughs> and I was literally the first person there on that day. The first person to bungee jump, they book with me. And I'm like, my ab, do you want to do it with me? She was like, bitch, you're by yourself. Like, <laughs> you got that. That's all you. And I did it. And it was just like the rush of facing my fear and like conquering my fear. And it reminded me because like we were talking about death. And the first thing that I did, like, I mean, we, were, we ended up having to like run through the airport mm-hmm. to catch the plane. They were, were like catching the, like holding the plane for us. Like we had two other friends who were like catching, holding a plane for us. Like, wait, they're almost here. They're almost here. We're like running. And by the time I like sit down in the air, like in the airplane chair, I'm like sweating profusely from adrenaline because I just jumped off of a bridge because I almost missed this plane ride. I had to run through customs. It was so much. And I remember like not telling my parents anything until I came back here and then I had a CD that like they made. Um, and I was just like, hello, everyone. like, I was like, we're gonna watch a movie. And I, <laughs> oh, it was glorious. I just put it on and I just watched their reactions. And now I wish I had documented it because they're watching, they're like, oh, this is beautiful. Where is this? Where is this? what is that you are you what are you gonna do and it was hilarious watching my mom because like the guy's counting down for you you know and this is my mom the whole time no 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 and i'm like i'm literally right here like i i am alive i'm i'm like here showing you this it's like no she's yelling at the screen i'm just like yo i really almost died and here i am showing y'all like <laughs> Hey I'm fine. <laughs> After the fact, like I'm right here. <laughs> I love she was yelling at the computer, like, no, no, don't, don't do it. It's just kind of like, uh, it happened. I it mean, happened, girl. And she was like, are you crazy? Are you? I'm like, mm, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> but I did always feel like my dad was just a little bit proud of me for doing it, you know? Because <laughs> I remember how much you know up front. <laughs> Right? Because he's like, I want you to do more crazy shit. But kinda, kind of really, you're bold. Because he was having a conversation with me one time and he was like, yeah, my friend was talking about, you know, going scuba diving. And he was like, yeah, have you ever been? And my dad was like, I looked at him, I said, 
my daughter, she went scuba diving, she went skydiving, she went bungee jumping. She's brave. Yes. I love that energy when that because I think that's amazing thing when um one it's such uh it's so amazing to grow up um with um a father an active father in your life or active um male figure in your life um and to have them like oh well my daughter does this this and yeah. this and that <laughs> my dad says like yeah I tell my friends that I was like oh you tell them about me and right. I but like, I know who his friends are they like you know, grew up, I've known yeah. these, went to college with them, you know, I know these, uh, these men, but it's just so funny, it's just like, oh, you talk about me? Oh, this is so yeah. nice. <laughs> it is, it is, it's nice, it's really nice, it's nice to be thought of, and I'm like, wow, like, so you think I'm brave? <laughs> I am, thank you. I'll remember that next time we, right? <laughs> next time I'm trying to do something crazy, and you tell me, no, but, like, but I'm brave, oh, Baba. Man. I'm brave, remember? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so um, with you being brave, uh, how how was it you being a uh, wad kalafala in doing all these things, whether it's jumping off of waterfalls, um, scuba diving, or even... Um, even, you know, when, when you're in Malaysia, and next question is definitely about Malaysia, because that whole experience, just watching it, I was like, oh, this is a beautiful, oh. <laughs> this is so beautiful. But how, how um, is it for you um, navigating spaces and different spaces, um, whether they cater to your likeness um, or cater to you um, spiritually or religiously, um, how was it for you to navigate through those spaces while studying abroad or traveling abroad? Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, oh, it's such a loaded question because, like, I'm Muslim mm -hmm. and um, I hate, I don't like using, like, the, like, I'm not a practicing Muslim because I think, like, I think religion is all intentional, personally, you know, like, it's it's all, like, based on intention. And so my whole life, I grew up in a place that never catered to my religion. Like, I grew up here and <laughs> nothing here is, like, Muslim-based, you know what I mean? So, like, that's what I'm used to. That's what I'm comfortable with is, like, Christian based things, um, Christmas, or like we're celebrating Easter, like not in my family, but like my friends do. And they're like, come over, like we're doing this. And, and it's so funny because, you know, you would think my parents would understand, like, I love to travel because I'm interested in different cultures. But mm -hmm. similarly speaking, like we live in a different culture than what is ours. Sure. And so like when Christmas happens, when Easter happens, I'm like, yo, I want to go. Like, I, what are y'all doing? Like, I want to, is it an Easter egg? You're, you're like, so there's a bunny, right? And I'm like looking. Okay, right, right, right. Like that's, I'm just curious. I'm just a curious being. Um, when I went to Malaysia, mm -hmm. it was, that was what for me was the culture shock because I've never lived in a country like outside of Sudan when I was like born through five years old, which is like very fundamental, don't really remember much. Mm -hmm. But when I went to Malaysia, it was my first time really, truly like living in a Muslim country. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited to um, like rediscover my religion in a way, because like living the way that religion has was taught to me and like I'm sure has been taught to a lot of people is out of fear, like fear based religion. So like mm -hmm. do this so you don't go to hell. Yeah. Do this so you, you know, God is not mad at you. Mm -hmm. And that for me was like very much a turnoff. I was like, all right, like bro is getting mad at everything. Like I'm just, I don't even know. I don't even, I'm just not even going to look at this. So I just like not wrapped it up real neatly. And I'm pretty sure I wrote like an Instagram post about this and like put religion in a nice little box in the corner that I would visit on like holiday special occasions. Like, mm -hmm. oh, it's an Ramadan. Like, let me hit the religion box. How we do <laughs> it? That, and then just, it's gone, I'm done. Like, oh, it's Eid, like, let me go back, you know? And like, just like have little hit points. Mm -hmm. And I was really excited about Malaysia because I thought that it gave me a really immersive um, experience into what it would be like to be a Muslim growing up in a Muslim country where the Azan, or like for people who don't know, like the call to prayer mm -hmm. is going off five times a day. Which like, so beautiful. It's, be it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Like, it's Christian woman, it's beautiful. Like, I, I loved it. I, I was so nice. I was like, oh, I like this. 
it's so not, and like I love the fact that we're we're in a society now that talks a lot about mindfulness and meditation and so when I started looking at prayer as like moments for mindfulness or moments for meditation instead of coming from like a place of fear I started to really look at my religion through like a lens of love mm -hmm. and that really shifted like how I viewed myself how I viewed my religion how I viewed other Muslims because it almost felt like everything I had taught had been a lie, you know, like, this is what? And I, I actually like started reading the Quran and like trying to understand versus, versus taking other people's experiences and absorbing them as my own, um, other people's knowledge about what the religion says or what the religion says not to do or what the, I just said, well, let me read the book that is the religion. Like, let me read the Quran. Like, that's step one of, <laughs> of any religion is like, pick up the book, read. Um, so that's what I started trying to do is like really dive into understanding the religion, what I believe, what I agree with, like how I view it. And just taking, out of, taking it out of that box that I had left it in for so long out of fear of isolation from like, my peers um, out of fear of uh, out of fear of rejection, like f whether it's like from my family or from God and and really started to look at it as just like a, a religion of love, which is honestly what I believe all religions to be. I think all religions are religions of love. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so funny, all of the pieces that led up to that, because like you knew that I was Muslim or that I was Sudanese because I used to wear hijab when yeah. we were in high school. Right, like that. I'm pretty sure that's when we met. I was wearing a hijab, yeah, <laughs> and then it was like the slow taking off of the hijab, like when mm -hmm. I was in high school, and then it became like it became a lot of assimilating. That now looking back, I'm like, wow, I wish I slowed down. Like I so badly wanted to like blend in with the culture of America, blend in with mm -hmm. this, 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 and maybe even, and this is just me speaking candidly and freely now, honestly, Justine, but maybe a part of that too is like, Islam doesn't fit very neatly into America. You know, like there's no call to prayer happening five times here. So maybe that's another, that was another factor that made me want to wrap religion up nicely and put it in a box. But the slow uncoming of that was something like, something way more beautiful than I could ever describe. It was, it was like a coming into my own, a coming into myself, a very much how I was describing um, when you go to another culture, someone has to open that door for you and bring you in and be that bridge for you. Mm -hmm. I realized that when I closed off myself from my culture, I also closed all of my friends off from knowing a really big part of who I am, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's why I started Taste of Sudan, um, yeah. which is, for the like, uh, I was like, for those of you who don't know, everyone I'm sure here does not know what that is. Taste of Sudan. <laughs> <laughs> Taste of Sudan is um, a cultural experience that I've curated, filled with taste and smells and visuals that talks about um, Sudan, all the amazing food in Sudan, all the amazing music that comes out of Sudanese people, um, because there's nowhere else that does that. Um, you, there's bare, there's no zero Sudanese restaurants that I know of in the dmv area mm -hmm. um based on my research there's maybe like two sudanese restaurants in the whole united states and sudanese people right sudanese specifically sudanese because yeah. sidebar um sudanese people will sometimes open up a restaurant but make it mediterranean we're not mediterranean uh, we're sudanese we have our own isn't as flavorful as um i would just say like food from like middle eastern or arab cultures yeah um and yeah I it's I, not yeah it's not the same and I just I think it does it a disservice to group them together I understand why some people do it but I just wanted to create literally a taste of Sudan where I welcome people into a space that's traditionally Sudanese decorated where they try traditional Sudanese food experience different cultural dances and different cultural tastes um and it's a beautiful event I've had so many people reach out to me because they want it again and again and again. And COVID has just been like, psyche you thought. Um, <laughs> but hoping, hoping once everyone is vaccinated, because, you know, Biden said May. So hoping once everyone is vaccinated that we can sort of revamp that and start that again. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's, 
that was man, I don't, I don't even know where this question started. Like, how do I present myself in these spaces? But essentially that's like been the evolution, I think of like how I've decided to present myself or like to experience other cultures, especially, or like places where I'm not the main religion um, versus places where I am. It's been a journey, you know? <laughs> and it's been such a beautiful journey. And it's so funny because in my mind, when you, like thinking back to like high school, Justine, when you uh, stopped wearing your um, hijab, in my mind, I was like, oh, like, you know, Muslim women cannot, don't have to wear hijab. Like that was my mind, I was like, oh, they don't have to wear it. And it was so funny because people were like, well, they have to wear it. I'm like, actually they don't. Like, you know, like, like <laughs> they don't. Like, I, like, this is what I know. <laughs> yeah. I think now looking back at it, I was just like, oh my gosh, you could have kept it on. I would have still been your friend. I know. It wasn't, you know what it was actually like, and I think about this often too, is I was, when you're the only, and I'm sure like Mm. Black, Indigenous, and people of color can all relate to this. When you're the only of whatever identity you relate to, you become the spokesperson. You know, and I just, I felt so uncomfortable. It wasn't that I was the only Muslim in the school. It was that I was like one of the only like outwardly, like I'm wearing a hijab type, like Muslims in the Mm -hmm. school. Um, And as such, like I'm the default representative. And I just didn't Mm -hmm. feel like I would, I felt so uncomfortable because I felt like, man, I'm not carrying myself in a way that like I would want to represent Islam, you know, (laughs) like. I don't feel like I should be the one to be doing this right now. Like anyone else? Yeah. (laughs) I felt so uncomfortable with that. And that's, that's ultimately why I decided to take my hijab off. Cause I was like, I don't want to be the person people turn to and they're like, well, I knew a Muslim. She was cursing up and down. She was like, nah, bro. I don't want those sins. Go find another. (laughs) Like I'm good. I don't want none of that. Don't use me. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but I think that's uh, I think that's so real because when you're when you're the o- when you're the only of anything, it's just kind of like, and people are like, well, what do you think? And it's just like, oh, did you really just ask me that question, girl? And you don't want to be in those in those situations, and it's just kind of like, well, how do I level the playing field so I'm not in these situations anymore? And I mean that's. I think that's a that that that's a honest that's survival that's assimilation that's code switching in a way of just saying like okay what I'm not, what we not gonna do today this right month, this month this year uh, is put me in the limelight for whatever you have questions for um, but it's so funny because uh, I feel like. So I think one moment that I I remember you, I think you were on the phone with your mom and you were talking to her about why you were staying after school, why you need to be picked up at a certain time. Mm -hmm. And we were in theater practice. So so we were theater geeks, you guys. Um, (laughs) The best, the best to ever do it. Um, But uh, you you were talking and you were speaking in Arabic. And I think I came around the corner because I was like, where's what? And then I heard something, I was like, oh, and I was like, what were you speaking? And you looked at me like, <laughs> and I was just like, this sounds so cool. <laughs> like me, like not even thinking like, oh, it could be like, just like, oh my gosh, it sounds so cool. And you were like, oh, you're like, I was, I'm, I'm speaking to my mom, I'm speaking Arabic. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And like, I will tell you, you were definitely one of the um, biggest influences on why I wanted to speak and learn Arabic. Um, because I was like, it sounds so beautiful. And I was like, I want to learn how to learn how to speak Arabic. <laughs> oh my goodness. So when I, uh, started to learn it, I remember, um, like learning it. And I was like, man, like I'm going to be able I'm gonna speak it fluently and I'm going to go back. I'm going to see what, and I'm going to be like, Assalamu alaikum. like, we're just going to go ahead. <laughs> You know, unfortunately, people, you know, I can do greetings and then people go off and I'm like, shui, shui. Like, that, that, right. <laughs> oh, shui, shui. Yeah. Like, we can go stop right there. Right. Um, but you were definitely like such a, a big reason on why I 
It's like, I want to learn Arabic. And people are like, Arabic? And I'm like, yeah, why not? Because I, I just thought it was such, um, it was such a, 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 a different um, language. I think um, a lot of times, all, and although it is a beautiful language, Spanish is very beautiful. I love it. Um, but I wanted to learn something different. And I was like, Arabic, like who wakes Justine, up? Justine, I never knew that. I, I just knew that. that. I yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so amazing. <laughs> it's so funny because like we talked about assimilation and like how in my context here to America, like not I demonized it, but I was like, yeah, I like was, I made myself assimilate more, but then we're saying like, when you go overseas, like, please is also assimilate. And I think there is a fine line because like very similarly to just what happened between me and you, like mm -hmm. just as much as like that place is going to have an effect on you, like you will have an effect on the place that you go mm -hmm. to, you know? And like the most simple of examples it's so crazy how you like I literally didn't know and that just made me smile so much like I'm just so happy that I would even cross your mind to be like yeah like that seems cool I would want to learn this um but during my time in Malaysia like there's a lot of colorism there you know as colonialism has swept the globe mm -hmm. um and so I remember a lot of darker a lot of my darker students were Indian students mm -hmm. um and a lot of them would just especially the girls would talk about like how dark their skin was and how like, you know, X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. um, and I know through like lots of communication with like other black women who were like in the cohort with me, with myself that like, there've been so many, like I, I still have students hitting me up, like teacher, you make me love my skin or like teach, you know what I mean? And it's like, I didn't even, it, it's not, it doesn't even always have to be an overt, like, oh, I did something, but just mm -hmm. like being yourself and like mm -hmm. warm and welcoming and like open to them, like shows people a different light and, and all of that, just to say that like, you're, you always have an impact on people, even when you don't know. And like, you were the clearest example of that just now, Justine. Yeah, it was, I was just like, oh. and you all like, I don't know, I feel like we've had so many moments. There was one moment I was scared about something I don't know if I applied for a program or something and I was so scared and I was like shaking and we were in the same spot. All right. We're always outside the theater, you guys. Yeah. I, love that place. I know exactly what you're talking about too. And I think you, you were like, what's wrong? And I was like, I'm just really scared. And uh, you were like, Oh, can I pray for you? And I was like, yeah. And like, mind you guys, so I, I'm Christian and I was like, heck yeah, I'm taking all the prayers. <laughs> I'm taking it. Like, what what's the prayer today? Um, and you and so you pray you prayed in um in Arabic and I was just like in Beth, I was like, Oh, like this is like it's so like heartwarming. Cause I think um a lot of people don't I think specifically with um Christians and uh, Muslims, there aren't um there aren't a lot of moments like that or those moments aren't broadcast um you know you see one every now and then uh but it's not like something that should be deemed as normal and um i always find it weird because these religions were all founded you know in the same area so it, you know where we have a lot of similarities although there's difference there's a lot of similarities and um I think we do a disservice to ourselves as members of our religion or, you know, whatever your uh, religion is or whatever you identify as spiritually um, to not be kind or not to show community and love towards others. Um, and when you did that, I was just like, oh, like, God really loves me. Thank of you. Of course, of course. And it's, oh man, it's, I love hearing stories back like that from high school or like from before because they remind you of like where you were at that time like what you know what I mean like just where I was in my spiritual journey at that time too mm -hmm. like that's really what I just paid attention to is like wow like when is the last time I asked someone if I could pray for them and then did so in Arabic like because even now I pray I like I still do like pray with people pray for people mm -hmm. but now it's in English mm -hmm. you know um, and I just think of like the transformation, 
there, it's so funny because I think so much as adulthood is just getting back to who you were as a child. I really do. And and I think that's so true because I've had moments recently where I felt like a kid and I was like, am I supposed to be learning something? Because that's what I'm taking it as. But I think it's a lot of times it's just kind of like these insecurities and these worries, this anxiety you have that you didn't have when you, like, you may have had it when you were a kid, but it wasn't so big. It's just like, let it go. Yeah. Like No worries. Yeah. When like, you could just do anything literally do any and that, that when you were young you had this mindset that I could do anything you're like yeah oh, this is and then as you get older it narrows down but we're at that age and I think our generation in general millennials we're just kind of like we busting that shit open we're like ah, nah I don't need it. <laughs> I, I want to be able to pick at everything and you know to do all these things and um really you know living the best life in I think taking YOLO because we definitely grew up in the time of YOLO or at least college our college years were YOLO and like you only live once so if I only live once how can I make the best of this life that I'm living and I think um like part of it is you know it's studying abroad it's traveling abroad and it's also like really just being aware um of yourself and really learning to like love yourself and get to know yourself in a different way um, or in an old way yeah. that um, you kind of uh, left in the past and really bringing it back and like really working on that and making it part of who you are now. So, yeah, I- no, absolutely. I 100% agree. Well, I'm uh, the journey, you know what I mean? Like, it's just such a journey. Um, but something I always try to Something I always try to think of, like no matter everything that I need is already within me. And Mm -hmm. if it's not, it's coming to me. So Mm -hmm. I have the resources, I have the tools. (sighs) It's just execution, sis. (laughs) The execution is hard. (laughs) I'm not going to lie. Execution is so, can be so hard, but making it past it um, and doing it like, I would just say like relating this to study abroad applications like it's so funny somebody told me to apply for Fulbright and I said no because at the time (laughs) I was already applying to like other programs and I was applying to other programs where you know you need writing samples you need this that that and I was like I'm not taking on Fulbright y'all not gonna put that on my plate and so I like literally I said no to that one um but you get to a point in the application process where it's just kind of like, why am I doing this? Like, I don't want to keep going. This is hard. And it's wild because once you get past that point, you get to the end, like, quick. It's like, right, the ending, like, it's like, man, you turn the corner. Oh, there's the door to the finish door. I'm out. And then, like, uh, you know, you turn these applications in. And, you know, didn't get everything, definitely did not get everything I applied for. But when I did get things, it was just kind of like, it it was totally worth it. And the beauty and growth in that, and like, just like you said, like, you know, beautifully, like coming into things, um, I think that's, I think it sits um, better with me um, when things happen um, in a way where I've had to work for it. And I get it, um, and I've used like my resources and everything I have versus, you know, oh, um, it was just handed to me. Yeah, you, know, you, don't, you don't have the same appreciation for it. That is one, yeah, one hundred percent, absolutely true. And like, just for anyone who's like looking for a job or like whatever, you know, I came back from Malaysia in the middle of a pandemic. Um, was was evacuated was emergency evacuated from malaysia within hours uh, right it was like it was it was i had oh my it's such a story but to to condense for everyone it was essentially i had because i was on a trip at the time because of course where else would i be <laughs> i was on an island remotely living my absolute best life <laughs> 
pandemic where sweetheart i don't know her um and we because at that time like nothing serious was going on at least not where we were we got an email that said you have to be in the airport in like less than 24 hours there are only two boats that come to the island per day the first boat had already left uh we had to wait for the second boat we had to check out early get our stuff on the boat and then once we landed on the other side um, it was a seven hour drive to get back to my apartment. I then had four or five hours to pack all of my belongings into two suitcases and drive two and a half ish hours to the airport to get on a plane to come to the United States. Um, so like shit show is the bare minimum <laughs> of what was happening when I came back. Um, but <laughs> let I person know like right oh justine you have no it was it was crazy they, it was so they initially started off by saying like voluntary evacuation like if you want to go you can and i was like girl boo like we've only done three months or so i'm mm -hmm. not going anywhere like i'm i was supposed to go philippines and then i had an administrator from the school I was working at speak to me and just be like, international travel is not that safe right now. Like we just prefer if you stayed in the country. And I'm like, say less, like Malaysia is beautiful. The islands are amazing. Like I'm not even mad, my guy. Like, okay, I'll stay. That's nothing. Is that a so threat I said, that I have to? Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I stayed, I was like, okay, just because I'm staying doesn't mean that I have to like be here. Like I'm just gonna travel in the country. That's why I went to the island. But of course my ass would pick the, the island furthest away, um, just doing the most per usual. But it was 1 million percent worth it. I would do it all over again. That was such a, oh, it's such a beautiful experience. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was so hectic. I I. And I was so sad that I like couldn't say bye to the community that I had just built. I couldn't say bye to the the friends and the families and the students that I had built these really, really genuine and authentic relationships with. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, such as COVID, and just relating it back to what you were saying about applications and like the execution. When I came back to the United States, like I literally applied to almost two hundred positions to get the position that I have now. Like you are working against COVID in a market that is heavily saturated with graduates. People, mm -hmm. you know, um, people were getting laid off. Like it was really, really difficult, um, but you can't apply to two or five and be like, okay. And that's for anything like yes. Fulbright's yes. study abroads included. You can't apply to just the two, the five and be like, all right, well, like, we'll see what happens. You know, that's a, I think those are very rare circumstances. Like the fact that I only applied to Fulbright because someone told me to like, and like believed in me in that way. And like, I still got it. I think that is literally the universe conspiring in my favor. But I think like the work that has to go behind mm -hmm. applications and stuff is like, that's what gives you the best opportunity mm -hmm. to get out. At that is absolutely true like the just um i mean i've had times where i'm like oh i applied for one or two things and i may get one of them um but i've had times where i'm like i'm applying to like five more like and, and sometimes you have to do that uh yeah. if you're diligent and you're if you're serious about going to another area you have to it's just kind of like i gotta get out of here so what you gotta do to get out of there and that's kind of like you gotta come up with a game plan and, you know, when if you play basketball or you play uh, football, you know, you have plays. What's your play? If one plays Fulbright, the other play is, you know, maybe um, going to uh, Paris or going to Africa, you know, like wherever you want to go, you have to make a game plan. Oh. And um, I, 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 I agree with you, of course, because <laughs> everything works. <laughs> Um, the only thing I'll say is like after doing 200 plus applications, um, I believe that I have become an expert resume and cover letter writer. Um, I believe that. So much so that I, like I've literally helped over seven friends with their resumes and their cover letters and they got the job. So if anyone listening, 
yes. needs help with a resume or a cover letter, please reach out to me. Like, I literally only want to see us win. I just want to see us win. Like, in every way, in every fashion, like, if there's anywhere I can plug you, I promise you that I will. If there's anyone that I know who's interested, like who has an opening or is interested in something you're interested in, like I will connect you. I just want us to win because th these are the kinds of connections and resources that I wish I had when I was still learning and when I was still like trying to apply to whatever. So please reach out. I will get you a job if you need one. <laughs> No, I'm gonna put your information down uh down uh, beneath you because I think that is so I think we get scared. Like I I I told you um before we started recording, I, I was scared to reach out to you because I was like, oh why it's so so busy. But <laughs> honestly, like you do a disservice to yourself when you um when you don't reach out to people yes. and simply ask. Like the worst thing they can say is no. And it's like, okay, they said no. But a lot of times people wanna help. People want to be like, hey, I know this person who's looking for somebody who can do this, this, and this, and it pays a million dollars. I don't want to do that job, but I'm trying to put somebody on who can yeah. do that job. And I think um, we, we as um, members of the BIPOC community have to learn how to use um, nepotism to our advantage. Um, I think that... <laughs> a word. I, I mean, I, I think we um, we don't use it as our white counterparts use it. They use it literally from birth to death. And um, I, I think it's important, whether if that means I have a job and I'm like, oh, man, I'm like, that's another black girl. Like, oh, I want to put her on to this or that, you know, that girl's Latinx. I want to put her on to this them, you know, him, him, her, they, whoever they are putting them on like I think that's important because when we put people on to um to uh these experiences and put people on to you know on like how to do things it literally changes not just their lives but other people's lives and when we learn how to operate in that way and I always think that you there is a healthy form of nepotism that you can do um and I think that like we should operate in that way and i think that's like that's what this podcast is for like to say hey this is a podcast for you if you're if you're not part of the bipoc community that's fine you can still listen but if you are like this is for you like yeah soak this all up get the gems uh and really just learn absolutely everything you can please it's so important. And honestly, like, I just, something that I think so many people in, in like, in underserved communities, in the Black, Indigenous, people of color communities go through is imposter syndrome. And that starts way before you get into a job. That starts at the application process. You know, that starts at like, should I apply? Should I not apply? And especially like for women, um, sweetheart, those men, they're applying to those positions that they're not qualified for. And you know what? They're fucking getting them. They're getting them. And my last, my last tidbit of advice, just on the job, honey, jobs, whatever, because <laughs> I got a lot to say, is I, if you, anyone, anyone, but especially women, if you don't ask for more money, I will personally find you. And ring you. I will personally search for you and chew you out via email. Okay. I will personally <laughs> ask for more. I don't care if it's at the top. Like this is everything more. Ask for more. Ask for more because Absolutely. they're not offering you all that they have. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times you should be going back and forth at least once or twice. Cause once they offer it to you, they've already invested in you. They want you. Ask for more, please. A word. A word. No, and negotiate. <laughs> like no, that that is so true. Like the whole thing of um, needing to negotiate uh, for more money, uh, better benefits, 
You know, like if somebody's not moving on money, get that money in other ways. Like get it in more vacation days or PTO, get it in, you know, healthcare, get it in 401k, like do do there's so many other ways to secure the bag you deserve. Even if it's something literally as, and this may be what is simple to them, a title. I will do this job, but instead of being called X, instead of calling me program associate, I'm, I want my title to be program coordinator. I'll do the same job, same everything, but now I'm coordinator. What have you just done? Elevated your resume. Yes. Cause you're not staying there for long sis. Okay. You're not staying there necessarily for long. You just got to go get your experience and move on to your next place. And when you move to that next place, you know what they're going to see? Oh, she was a program coordinator. It doesn't matter that you were doing program associate work. It's, not, <laughs> it's none of their business. None of their business. <laughs> their business is what you, is that resume and cover letter that you gave them and that money that yes. they're going to offer you. So, Which I can help with. Reach out. Please reach out. Oh, I have so many resources to offer. Please. No, no, you guys, uh, follow email and uh, Instagram at the bottom. Um, make sure you reach out to Wad. Um, and so now we're going to, we're, 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 we're going to be done with questions. Now okay. it is story time and we are going to go into that time. I, so that time I is, um, a chance that I or a global homie, uh, which in this case is Wad Kalafala, uh, she's going to share a story uh, about that time she uh, did something abroad. And it could be funny. It could be a learn a lesson learned. It could be a sad story. Um, you can decide what type of story you want to tell. Um, it is all up to you. And I have not heard this story, you guys. Um, so I'm like excited to hear it because Wad is an amazing storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate the vote of confidence. I love telling this story. So I'm just, I'm going to roll into it. Um, this is the time I, <laughs> um, this is a time where I was in South Africa. I believe I was in Joburg. Um, we just finished after a really long day of like adventures, da, 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 and we went out to dinner. Um, so I was in like a basic, like long skirt top, you know, like a jean jacket, potentially even. Um, and my friends were in like similar as clothing, but we ended up like staying so like relatively long at dinner. And then afterwards we were like, oh, like let's go to the strip. Like we heard the strip is really fun and the strip is obviously like filled with clubs and bars and we're looking for Afro like Afro pop music, like, you know, like hit me with those Afro beads. Give me that one too. Like, I just want to shake my rump bum bum. And so we're asking everyone like, yo, where are the Afro beats? Where's the Afro beats? And then someone was like, yo, go to this one place. They have all the Afro beats. It's lit. Like there's always a line. And I'm like, okay, cool. So we ask a couple more people. They all are like, yo, go to this place. And we're like, yo, that's clearly the place. Like we have to go. So we go and as we're walking up, cause we're walking everywhere. As we're walking up, we see this long, long line. And so my friends are like, okay, no, like we're not waiting in this line. They're like, look at all these girls. Like they're in heels and dresses. And like, we're not even dressed for the occasion. And I was like, are you kidding? I was like, absolutely not. No, like we're, we're going to the front. We're going to the front. And they're like, what? And I was like, follow me. <laughs> They're like, okay, I don't know why they follow me. I was like, no, 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 come on. Like, let's just try. Like, we have to at least try. Like, we're we're in Joburg. Like, what are we? Of course. So I walk up to the front and um, there's like a little lobby area. And sorry, you walk up to the front. There's a guy holding a list, right? And I was like, I'm on the list. So he's like, okay, like looking, looking. He's like, I can't, you know, I can't find you. And I was like, no, like I'm on the list. Like, you know, I was put on. He was like, okay, like who put you on the list? And I was like, oh, it was like some guy, we met him like on the strip, or lying, lying. Some guy like, we met him on the strip, or his name's like with a J, like, I don't know, like James, like J something with a J. And he was like, Jamal? And I was like, Jamal, yeah, 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 Jamal. And he was like, okay, he was like, step to, he was like, go ahead, step inside into like the little lobby area. 
He's like, step inside. I'm going to call the manager. And I was like, okay. So we step inside and I'm like, okay, bitch. I don't know what. I was like, and I'm looking at my girls like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's fine. Like, I, mean, I got this. Like, we're good. And inside I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. So the manager comes and he was like talking to us. Um, he's like, what's up? I'm like, you know, Jamal put me on the list. And like, now the guy's saying I'm not blah, blah, blah. And there's a girl next to him. And she's like, I mean, they're not even in dress code. And I'm like, I mean, seriously, we came all the way, like, blah, blah, blah. Like, Jamal didn't tell me there was a dress code. Like, is this really how you guys treat your patrons? Like, that's really unfortunate. Right? I'm just ballsy. Just a ballsy bitch. I and love so, it. Jamal, if you're watching this, I so, so he's like, okay, this is the owner. I'm speaking to the owner of said club. The owner's like, give me one second. He goes, hey, Jamal, come on down me <laughs> literally this is me me to him oh jamal's coming down yeah okay cool yeah because he'll he'll clear it up for us like it'll be fine me inside <laughs> are you crazy my friends are in the corner like oh we're about to be embarrassed like this is gonna be embarrassing like they're like inching out and i'm just i have planted my feet in the ground i'm just like no so Jamal comes down the stairs, right? Because he's uh, he was upstairs. And supposedly Jamal is hosting the party, right? <laughs> so he comes downstairs. He has a whole mic in his hand. Um, he comes downstairs and the guy's like, um, the owner is like, Jamal, you know this girl? I was like, hey, Jamal. I was like, remember we like saw you on the strip earlier? You said you were going to put our names on the list. Um, and then he just like looks at me. I was like, remember, it was like me and my three friends. And he looks at me and then he looks at the owner. He's like, yeah, my bad. They're with me. And then the owner is like, I told you stop forgetting to put people on the list. Like, well, what? he was like, my bad. Just let them on it. And the girl's like, they're not even in dress code. And so then the owner's like, it's fine. Just go ahead, y'all. Go ahead. Right. So we cut this whole line. Okay. Yeah. I'm walking up the stairs like, bitch, of course I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> me, me. The minute I'm out of sight, I'm like, thank you, Jamal. Jamal, thank you so I'm like giving him the biggest hug, like Jamal, my God, like you came through. We were ready to be embarrassed. Like I was gonna get thrown out, underdressed, like, and then Jamal's holding a mic. He walks into the party. I didn't even notice he was holding a mic at first. He walks into the party. He was like, Yeah, he's like, it's no problem. It's no, he's like, What's your name? And I was like, what? He was like, all right, everybody, welcome on, on to the mic. And he hands me the mic. And I'm like, what's up, everybody? <laughs> you know, he didn't know what he did. I, he had no idea. He had no <laughs> idea. We, I spent the whole night just, like, buying Jamal drinks. Like, Jamal, it's all on me. Bro. And he's like, I literally work here. It's on me. Like, it's... You're right. I, I work here. I was so thankful. That is one of my favorite experiences abroad. Yeah. Jamal came through. We cut the line. I wasn't in dress code. I heard Afro pop, Afro beats all night. Like, that's all I wanted. And it was spontaneous. Like, <gasps> it just fell. It just fell into place. That was the best. I, I love that story. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm, like, jealous I wasn't there. But... <sighs> <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Why. Like that oh. one, when you say he handed you the mic in my mind, I went back to high school. I was like, why the dot? Like, he don't even know. Like, <laughs> he don't know. He, he didn't, didn't know. know. Like, he <laughs> to be on the PA system giving us the raps in the morning. Like, she's a she. She's about to cut an album right here in this club. Oh, not me, me on the mic. Like, what's up, everybody? Everyone's like, oh. I really felt... Jamal made me feel like a celebrity. He really made me, he was like, welcome Wad. Everyone doesn't know me, but they're like, oh, Jamal knows Wad. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, shout out to Jamal. If you shout ever out. hear this, shout out to you. Uh, you you're an MVP. Jamal, my day one. I love you, Jamal. Thank you so much for allowing me to keep my dignity um, <laughs> because I would have been so embarrassed. <laughs> I would have just, oh, that would have been really bad. But I, I'm so thankful and appreciative, Jamal. Oh, my <laughs> God. You love to hear these things because, you know, you go into these situations, you go, like, oh, crap, is this going to happen? Is that going to happen? Right. It's like, 
um, um, um. And then it next is. thing you know, just like, oh, everything's fine. It is, <laughs> yeah, it's about the confidence on everything. I believe that like, if you just go in there like, no, I know this, like we're fine. They're gonna be like, damn, is, is this bitch fine? Like, all right, let her in. She's not even in dress code. Like, ah, let her in. <laughs> I, that is so true. Like, I've had situations where I'm in clubs and we're with friends and it's an empty club. And of course, most likely, I'll always say like, wherever I go, I, uh, I, I have a rainbow coalition of friends. If they're not all black, it's a rainbow coalition. So everybody's, right, right. you know, it's a little bit of everything in our group. Right. <laughs> and we went out, uh, where were we? We were either in Germany. We were in Germany or we were in Argentina. And it would have been the same group of friends regardless. I love that. Well, we uh we were in the club and it was like empty, but we went in and the DJ started like getting better music. We were like, okay, so we're like dancing, and next thing you know, the club is packed, and it's yeah. like <laughs> it's like because these black girls are in there like dancing, and people walking by and seeing. Yeah. It. <laughs> That's like, literally it. It's like this idea of just like li- really just living life, like. I- all I can say is shout out to Jamal. That's all I can say. Shout, yo, the party is where you go. Like the, you, you have that mindset. That is absolutely the truth. Like you create the party. You create literally. You create the party. Your energy, your vibe. Like what you put out is always what you get back tenfold. So be kind to people. Yes. <laughs> no, seriously, be kind because if you're not. A... <laughs> okay, and that's the tea. <laughs> no. <laughs> no but thank you for so much uh sharing uh that time i your that time i story with us um so now uh it's time to bring this adventure to a close um we are as we leave malaysia uh and uh we unpack uh all the knowledge and everything that we learned today from the amazing Wad Kala Fala, you guys. Stop. <laughs> um, I, I just, again, I want to thank you so much for um, honoring, just it's an honor to have you here and really just being here on this podcast. Um, and I want people to be able to support you, whether it's um, any your projects, anything that you're doing, if you have a business, it, Anything that you have to offer, um, where can everybody uh, follow you on um, on social media, websites, yeah. whatever it is, name it, and so, I'm so- posted. <laughs> yes, uh, social media. One, thank you so much for having me, Justine. I'm I'm so blessed and so proud of you, and so proud of this that you like put together. It's such an important resource for so many people. Um, and I'm so honored that you would think of me to have me here today. So just want to say that um, for socials, <laughs> for socials, everyone, you can find me on Instagram at WanderlustWad. That's W-A-N-D-E-R-L-U-S-T-W-A-D. Um, on TikTok, you can find me at WiserWad. That's W-I-S-E-R-W-A-D. Um, or to make things simple, you can go to my website, www.wanderlustwad.com. Um, those are all the places you can find me. I'm sure you could find my Twitter, but you know, th- there's not much information on there. Just a bunch of retweets. <laughs> <laughs> just a bunch of, re- if you're looking for clownery, that's where you can find me. Um, <laughs> on Twitter at Wad loves you. Um, and yeah, like in terms of business, business things I have coming up. Like I said, I'm always more than willing to help with resumes, cover letters. Um, really excited about that. Really excited about Taste of Sudan coming in the spring and summertime. Um, so everyone be on the lookout for that. Yeah, that'll be posted I'm on coming home for that. You should, you should. Um, and we might be expanding Taste of Sudan to DC also. Um, so everyone be on the lookout for that too. Right, right, big things, big things. Um, so everyone just like, you know, be on the lookout for that. Please feel free to reach out, whether it's questions about travel or work or school or life. I'm here. Your lover, traveler, poet, Wad. 
you guys again thank you so much wide for coming like it's for blessing us with you like for being here thank you so much and uh for all of you all listening and watching uh thank you again for joining us on this episode of study abroad like a g the podcast thank you bye everyone we ask that you please remain seated until the master g turns off the fasten your seatbelt sign all right now it's time to re-enter back into life unpack and share all the knowledge you got today and get ready for another adventure with one of my global homies and me justine the master g a study abroad like a g the podcast also remember to subscribe to study abroad like a g of uh, the podcast and follow study abroad like a g on facebook and on instagram at study abroad underscore like a g if you have any questions go on and ask me by messaging me on Instagram or Facebook, or you can email me at hbcusgoglobal at gmail.com. That is h-b-c-u-s-g-o-g-l-o-b-a-l at gmail.com. See you next time. Please remember to collect all items. We are hoping you enjoyed your time, and next time you consider studying abroad, make sure you do it like a G. See you next time.